and welcome to the On Stage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller, and with me once again is arts reporter Tony Tresca. Hey, Tony, uh, happy new year. Hey, Alex, happy new year to you too. Yeah, this is our first show back after the holidays. We took a, a little time off. Uh, it's this time of year where, you know, a lot of the uh, holiday shows uh, kind of wind down in, in the first week or so of January. So it's a little, little quiet theater wise, but things are really heating up. Uh, so we've got lots to talk about. We are recording this on. January 14th, which is uh, the coldest day of the year. So, well, it's not saying much. It's only January, but it was like, yeah, minus five. I think you said it's minus nine where you are. So it's yeah, really cold. Up, up in Boulder County, it's a negative nine feels like negative 22. So <laughs> good day to stay inside and go to the theater. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, so, so we, uh, as usual, we're going to review some of the latest shows that we've seen and or reviewed, as well as take a look at what's coming up around Colorado on stage all over the place. Uh, also, later in the podcast, uh, I, had, I did an interview with Ray Bailey from Ray Bailey TV. So Ray is the guy behind many of the really well done professional theatrical trailers that you'll see local theater companies using. And I had a great chat with him about how he got into that business. Uh, it's a, one of those pandemic stories. Uh, and also the value of video for marketing uh, theater. So, so uh, stick around for that. Um, also, I wanted to uh, give a tease to the first ever On Stage Colorado Awards for Theatrical Excellence, which I, <laughs> uh, which I'm calling the Oscars. If you think On Stage Colorado Awards, uh, there's the there's the thing there. And, the and, New uh, York in you is coming out. I hear, uh, I hear the accent in that. <laughs> I know. When I was 15, Oscar would have been rendered Oscar for sure. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so that's coming up. And so we took a, a little bit of a different approach. We did not say this is the number one best play. This is the number one best actor. What we did was we went through the 160 or so shows that we reviewed last year, which I still, mm-hmm. I still can't get my head around that number. It just seems like so much. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, and, and can, and we didn't even get to everything. That, oh, is, no. a, that is just, it's such an impressive number. I mean, this will tie, I guess, into our, larger conversation we're going to have in a second about the resilience of Colorado theater, but it's just yeah. impressive that coming out of the pandemic in 2023 there, we got to go to that many shows to review. Yeah. And that there were so many else other options out there for patrons and people to go and enjoy. Yeah, for sure. So, so what we, so since we wanted to recognize all of as much of this great work as we could, we have quite a few more reward uh, awards than like say the Henry awards where they, you know, they do more of like the Oscars or the Tony type thing where it's, you know, best this, best that. Um, and we also did a couple of different things where we don't have an actor slash actress category uh, we, or uh, supporting or lead actor. Uh, we just kind of bunch them all together uh, because a great performance is a great performance, whether mm-hmm. you're in a smaller role, or the lead role, if you're male, female, trans, whatever. So, so none of that stuff, which I think, I think we'll see some of that, uh, some other awards moving in that direction. So we're trying to be on the vanguard, right, Tony? Absolutely. We're cutting edge. I, we're, we're who need who needs gender? We're just going to award performances. That's right. Um, so we'll have the the announcement of those coming up in the next week or two. And uh, I don't know, thinking about maybe trying to do like a live, I don't know, a, a live stream on Facebook or something like that. So figure out the technical angle of that. So yeah, if you're, let us know what you'd be interested, and in. you can write us, uh, at, and you can always get in touch with us by reaching out uh, via our email uh, at the On Stage Colorado podcast. What is that email, Alex? Just info at onstagecolorado.com. Info at onstagecolorado.com. Yeah, so stick around. That's going to be uh, pretty exciting. I think there's going to be a lot of people uh, really excited to uh, see that, you know, maybe, maybe they didn't get recognized in some of these other awards. You know, there's, uh, of course, you know, John Moore does the True West Awards, which is um, a, a different kind of thing. It's more like mm-hmm. the people behind the scenes in a lot of ways. Uh, and it's a great series of, uh, I think, 30 that he does in December. Um, and and then, like, there's this Broadway world place that I'm not mm-hmm. entirely sure how they do it. I think that's maybe, like, voting or something. It is. Yeah, you, it's a, they they gather they gather the nominees and then you they do an open vote and then they just announce whoever won by the majority uh the like viewer audience vote yeah and and the way that not to not to diss on them but i mean it's really skewed it's like you know i think you know theater a gets everybody to vote for their show and theater c didn't even hear about it so uh so it's but you know still recognition is recognition is still something you can hang on your wall so so anyway so we will have that coming up soon maybe next week 
Um, so this week, uh, our main topic we wanted to talk about was uh, kind of kicked off with a story from John Wenzel in the uh, Denver Post mm-hmm. about the resilience of Colorado theater. And, uh, you know, there's been uh, like a 20% drop in theater attendance nationwide. And uh, this story was kind of about how Colorado has, has done a little better than that. It's still not you know, at pre-pandemic levels, but mm-hmm. Colorado as theater, theater community, theater industry has has really, uh, you know, kind of survived uh, a little bit better than, than some of many of the other states. So, uh, and part of that in the story, you know, we're talking about like mixing things up to maybe appeal to younger people with uh, like the theater of the mind uh, or, or other shows like that, that aren't just traditional theater experiences. And I'm thinking mm-hmm. also of like Space Explorers, which is coming up from the Denver Center at the Stanley Marketplace and, and even Drunk Christmas, you know, the, uh, Abs- Audacious, the immersive theater, you know, it's like just different. Yeah, I mean, Denver, I think, has really benefited from being on the cutting edge of the immersive world, too. I mean, we host the um, Denver hosts the immersion, immersive convention um, every year here. So we're it's a hot spot and a hub for creativity in that. And then I think another thing that ties in that's really helped Denver, Colorado stand out, as opposed to maybe some of these other cities that are, get mentioned, New York, Chicago, Boston, these conventional, typical cities you think of when you think of theater is... Denver is not waiting for those other places to send them scripts or they're not waiting to rent to like, oh, what, what's what's coming from New York? I mean, we're doing them. Regional premieres are hot. I, <laughs> they're real hot. There's a lot of them. I mean, Curious is Curious is doing those a whole bunch of them this season. Uh, but world premieres, too. We have local yeah. writers, Jeffrey Newman, uh, to just laugh as, as one of many uh, here is. We're doing the work to make Denver a place where theater is happening. It's being creative. And yeah. that's unique. Yeah. When I tell uh, friends uh, or people from out of state uh, about our website, they're like, is this theater in Colorado? I'm like, yeah, Colorado's got a lot of theater going on. Um, but um, so anyway, so, uh, you know, in addition to some of that more, uh, I don't know, kind of different out there stuff, that, you know, that familiar comfort food, uh, as he called it in the article, has its place also look at the candlelight mm-hmm. candlelight uh you know they only do well-known musicals and they sell out <laughs> a lot of shows uh in the arvada center you know there's some of those are just kind of tent poles uh you know that they can put butts in seats and maybe do some other stuff uh not candlelight per se they pretty much stick to it but but of course arvada center and some of the others that uh, have those big musicals and then you know they can they can afford to do some other things that maybe aren't gonna draw as many people but are still valuable Yeah, and I think another thing that has to also be acknowledged is like there is just a unique, there's an appetite for it here. This is another piece that John Wazell wrote uh, on the, just published on the 11th um, in there. And it's talking about how Denver's attendance rate uh, is compared. So the average attendance rate before the pandemic uh, for audience numbers to go to arts events was 48.5%, according to the National Endowment for the Arts. Compare that to Denver's rate for attendance. 76.8%. 76.8%. That is, an, that's almost 20, more than 25% difference in terms of audience attendance and willing to go out to arts events. And Denver's also just was the nub first in arts uh, exhibition attendance that, that year. And of course, these are pre-pandemic numbers. But as we saw from uh, the, we've talked about the, econ- the economic report that came out earlier this year, Denver's only down, down about 15% from before the pandemic, 15.6 in terms of audience participation, whereas nationally, it's still upwards of 20%. So even just comparatively, Denver is getting the audience back faster than some of these other places. Yeah. And just anecdotally, I mean, I think we know from going to a lot of shows that, you know, we're not seeing, you know, empty theaters uh, by any means. So Mm -hmm. um, also following up uh, some of the stuff that's being written about that, I just came across like just before we uh, started this, that an article in today's Colorado Sun about Mm -hmm. our state's contributions to the arts, which is important because, you know, uh, you know, the economy is doing this or that, you know, it's it's just hard to get people to donate as as much as maybe they used to. Uh, But they had some interesting statistics in here. So we are... um, in 46th place in terms of how much our state government contributes to the arts. Uh, yeah. And that, that equals 35 cents per resident per year. Uh, so on the, on the flip side, uh, Colorado ranks number one in the percentage of residents who personally perform or create artworks, according to the National Endowment for the Arts. 
participation study. And so the story says, uh, you know, what 46th place translate to is a $2 million budget for the Colorado Creative Industries programs in a state of 5.8 million people. Compare this with Colorado's neighbor, Utah, which has about 3.3 million people and allocates $9.5 million per year to its uh, arts agency. Uh, And they had this great graph that showed, you know, uh, Colorado sort of, you know, uh, miserably at the bottom. Uh, New York was number one with $12.27 per person. Maryland was number two. I was like, Maryland? Um, $11 uh, per person per year. And uh, Oregon, which is always, I kind of think of as a state sort of similar to Colorado, was two seventy nine per person. So there's obviously uh, a big gap there. And, you know, if if, uh, people, you know, people want potholes filled and all that stuff too, but we also want a vibrant arts community because that's what what makes civilization. Uh, So... Uh, but anyway, Absolutely. so the story went on to say that, you know, uh, Governor Polis, his proposed budget um, includes a one-time $16 million tax credit for creative workforce housing, which is huge, mm. and an additional $2.5 million for Colorado Creative Industries' annual budget, and a $540,000 cash fund for Colorado Creative Districts, which are supported by CCI. So that's good news. Uh, of course, it has to go through the legislature, which is like, uh, you know, a battleground right now. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, uh, but, you know, controlled mostly by controlled completely by Democrats. So hopefully that, that maybe that'll help. So adjacent to that next week, we, it just turns out that uh, I got in touch with Josh Blanchard, who is the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the executive director of Colorado creative industries. And so he's going to be our interview for the podcast next week. So we'll be able to talk to him about, you know, if that money comes through uh, what, what uh, CCI can do with it and how it'll benefit the arts. So, uh, so great timing there. I know Josh, uh, I've known him a long time. He was originally, uh, you know, uh, moved out with with his husband, Chris, to start uh, or to take over the Lake Dillon Theater, which is now Theater Silco. And then he went on to be a Summit County Commissioner. And now he is uh, head of CCI. So really interesting career and a great guy. So looking forward to that. Uh, another thing that I wanted to mention is a uh, shout out to the Boulder Dinner Theater, the BDT stage, uh, which is this is its final month of uh, – of shows uh, because yeah. their theater, their buildings getting sold out from under them. And so today, actually, I think this is January 13th. I think today's their last regular show of their final uh, run right. Fiddler on the Reef, but they're doing a New Year's Eve uh, performance of Fiddlers with, uh, you know, a celebration and everything. So that'll be the, I guess, the final lights out thing for Boulder Dinner Theater or mm-hmm. BDT stage. So, um, you know, I've been going to BD stage for decades uh you know uh, it's it's always been a great uh organization they always really solid um uh, you know shows they had a really mm-hmm. great uh, repertory to, or just kind of a you know a theater company uh doing the stuff there and it's just it's sad to see it go it was uh mm-hmm. it's uh one of those things that uh sometimes capitalism sucks you know um so yeah. what's been your experience with bd bdt stage don't you They've been one of my favorites. They're really, they're probably the, actually, I think, don't fact check me on this, but I think they're the theater that has been closest to where I actually am currently living. So Uh I've been, I went there all the time. I really love the shows. I love just being able to spend like five hours there and like you get to chat with the staff and it just feels like, I don't know, you feel like family there. I haven't been going there quite as long as you or many of the other patrons have, but even just in like the three years that I had been going, it has just been you felt that connection in there and the performances are incredible on that stage. You see why like people like Amy Adams and Sutton Foster got their start, how they got their start there and went on to incredible, amazing things from BDT stage. So it's a, it's a really big loss too for Boulder as a city, because now with BDT closing, there is no uh, full-time theaters that own their own space in Boulder anymore. Right. They are the last one. They were the last one. There's the Dairy Arts Center, of course, who does all sorts of arts programming, but that's kind of a home for those nomadic theater troops who don't have a uh, permanent building space. So uh, it, it's a really big loss for the yeah. community. Although, you know, you could make the argument that it's probably a better model to uh, rent the space rather than have to be, you know, a, a Running real estate, uh, but yes, yeah, it is it is sad. Um, so best of luck to all the folks associated with BDT Stage and and what you do next. Uh, would love to hear about mm-hmm. it. So, 
Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Well, um, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, a look around the state at all the live theater coming up in January and into February. The Onstage Colorado podcast is supported by Town Hall Arts Center, whose production of Year in Town runs January 26th through February 25th. The three-time Tony Award-winning musical comedy is set in a collapsing urban metropolis where a 20-year drought has led to a government-enforced ban on private toilets. The citizens must use public amenities owned and operated by an evil corporation that profits by charging admission to the most popular seat in the house, so to speak. A hero will rise, a revolution will be sparked, and an unlikely love story will unfold. Get tickets at townhallartcenter.org. Onstage Colorado is also grateful for support from the Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, Betsy, whose next show is What the Constitution Means to Me by Heidi Schreck. In this smart and timely comedy, Schreck resurrects her 15-year-old self who traveled the country competing in American Legion speech competitions to save money for college. Unearthing her perspective on the Constitution then and now, she delves into four generations of women in her family and how the founding document shaped their lives. The show plays in both Denver and Boulder. Info and tickets at Betsy.org. Okay, welcome back to the On Stage Colorado podcast. It's time for our weekly peek into some of the shows you can see on stage right now around Colorado. So uh, some of the shows that, uh, so uh, first couple of reviews of the year, I went to Newsies at Performance Now, uh, which is uh, planned through January 21st at the Lake Cultural Center. Uh, great show. Uh, Newsies is always a, a ton of fun to see. I had a, I had a couple of quibbles with some of the, mm-hmm. some of the sound. It was a little hard to hear. So, you know, the orchestra was kind of stepping on uh, some of the, some of the lines. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's a little bit more like a, uh, a mixed bag of talent. It's not like, you know, a lot of professional actors and it's a lot of, a lot of younger folks and it's, it's a little, it's a little all over the place, but, uh, some solid leads, uh, and overall a great, uh, fun show to check out. So, uh, and then the other show I went to that, uh, I think it ends, uh, this Sunday on the 14th, but Potted Potter, it, it comes around every year. It's a, you know, Potted Potter has become like this juggernaut, like kind of like there's several casts playing. I think there's one in Vegas that's on all the time. Yeah. yeah, they've got touring all their like all international productions and in addition to the ones in the US and, and North America. So yeah, it's a I, I got to interview one of the actors for Westward. It sounds like it's a very fun show to do acting wise because yeah. you are just like you get that immediate response from the audience. You get to if something's not working, you can change it up and they said he he described this show as like about seventy percent scripted, thirty percent improv. Which that sounds that sounds sounds like a fun way to keep things fresh. I I've, I've not seen it yet. I'm actually going to go this afternoon to see I, it. But I okay. I saw I saw your review of it, which uh, seemed a little bit mixed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you and I both performed in the kind of I don't know. I think of mm-hmm. like Potter Potter really took a lot of its uh, you know stuff from the complete works of william shakespeare and that and that series is a whole bunch of other shows with along that line from the reduced shakespeare company uh, mm-hmm. which is fine um but I, I just didn't think that it was as funny as i was hoping it would be and, and after about 10 or 15 minutes my wife and i both kind of looked at each other like what is this <laughs> um you know because it's, i feel like it started off a little slow uh but you know, it definitely has some fun moments. The crowd really loved it. You know, there's there's really a mix of humor. There's a lot of inside, definitely, you know, Harry Potter jokes that, you know, anybody who's a fan of the, the canon uh, will, will get a kick out of. There was, you know, there's a fair amount of puerile or, you know, sort of juvenile, you know, just slapstick and uh, things like that that are, that's fine. But, you know, sometimes I thought the bar was a little, a little on the low side and, um, but I, my my experience was also tempered by these people that brought like their five year old kid. Oh, I was like, you know, and, and I hate to sound like an old grump, but I tell you, the kid did not shut up through the whole thing. He was just like yelling <laughs> stuff out, and they were like, every once in a while, I'd be like, "Quiet, Johnny," you know, whatever. But Johnny never got quiet, uh, and so that really kind of cut into it. But that's no no reflection on the show. But and and they also they had uh, some pretty good uh, uh, production values. They had like smoke and lights and loud music and so it's definitely an engaging show and a decent amount of audience uh, participation so um also coming up fun home at vintage theater that is running through february 18th and our correspondent eric fitzgerald will be at that one so we'll have a review of that i heard heard the opening weekend completely sold out so if you it's in their smaller uh theater so if you are looking for tickets to fun home uh, it's a 
it's a pretty big musical, uh, Tony Award winning uh, musical. Uh, you should probably hop on it. They're doing so a I'm musical quick. in that tiny uh, that's, bond. That's accurate. Yes. Wow. Because yeah, that's like it seems like it's got like fifty seats or something. It's pretty small. I think it's like sixty or seventy in there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's such a funny theater. It's like a rectangle. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. This is the second musical uh, that they've I've seen in there recently because they did Tick Tick Boom uh, in their smaller space right. as well last season. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, up in Fort Collins, uh, open stage is doing Sweat, the Lynn Nottage play about disgruntled workers. So that opens uh, on the 13th and runs through February 10th. And our correspondent, Carrie Redman, will have a review of that. Um, this one uh, coming up at Miner's Alley Playhouse, uh, Misery, which is a, mm-hmm. an adaptation of the Stephen King um I don't know if it was it a novel or a short story that was first made into a, a pretty well known film back in like it's the a 80s. Book. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a book, and this this play is adapted by the same person who wrote the screenplay for that 1990s film starring Kathy Bates, which oh. she won her Academy Award for. Um, yeah, and it's a it's this is the first play in Miner's Alley's new space. They uh, I got to talk with the creative team over there about putting this together, and they just said it was really fun to be able to build this this show because it's so claustrophobic in that new space they're like we couldn't have imagined trying to rehearse this in like a church or something and then put it in here it's lovely that we have that rehearsal space now with the which obviously they can do once you have that 17 million dollar performing arts center (laughs) (laughs) yeah and i think i saw one of the photos of rehearsal it looked like you know they were able to do two levels uh Mm -hmm. which they really couldn't do in the old space so yeah uh, that's going to be a great one it's got a great cast emma messenger plays the lunatic annie who locks up this uh, uh author with uh, uh, you know, to get him to train, change the script to the his latest novel, which he didn't like, and also Mark Collins and Torsten Tillhouse, and this one's directed by Warren Sherrill, so that should be a banger. Uh, definitely check that out in Golden, and uh, and then uh, kind of a little bit on the other side of the metro area, uh, Pace Center is doing School of Rock, and that is uh, January nineteenth through February tenth. Of course, this was a well known film, uh, twenty years old now. It was twenty. It was two thousand three that came out with Jack Black. Yep. Such a great film. Such a funny funny story uh so i'm gonna be going to that one and excited to see that me too yeah this is a uh, andrew lloyd weber did sc- yeah. sc- this musical if you can believe it i but i was listening to the the songs and they are very fun it's like it's contemporary rock with like a dash of opera in there and this is the first collaboration between um the the pace parker arts and veritas productions who are they're really trying to bring high quality professional theater to parker that's great yeah and uh so nancy begley is going to be on the podcast i'm interviewing her this coming week so she'll be on the cat in the pod to talk about school of rock and uh and the new veritas uh also sabolis at denver center uh theater company is doing this from january 26th all the way to march 10th so this is one from the new place summit a couple of years ago that i remember the reading it's a it's a really interesting story about three latinas who are driving from albuquerque to denver with a dead body <laughs> so it's it's a it's a comedy of sorts and i know you're going to that one so we'll have a review from you so that's great yes i am i'm really excited i that just sounds like a great premise <laughs> yes yes it is i i remember the story i you know readings don't always you can't always remember exactly what they are because they you know they they don't leave as much of a, an impact on you since they're not acted out and stuff but I, I just really remember that one being really an interesting script so uh definitely want to check that out if you can um also clink clink uh from two cent lion uh returns so this is a yeah. uh, original play by kevin douglas uh a du student who formed this company with a couple of other uh of his, of his uh, uh folks from there's the school there mm-hmm. and there the, the sort of the in-house theater at the people's building in aurora this year so that's exciting for them that's so right that's... So they're going to be doing three shows over there they've got clink clink up first then they've got josie's diner and then they're doing rocky horror so it's a three show season to kick off 2024 over there right yeah and clink clink is a really uh it's a really touching story about two women and it starts from when they're girls and through their you know, into their adulthood and it's 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 a really great play great original play from from colorado playwright uh, and that is yeah. january 27th through february 11th uh, also coming up from the catamounts is uh they're continuing their series feed it's called this one's called feed or dry 
And so this is, it says, it explores the concepts of temperance, abstinence, hedonism, and moderation in modern life. So they're taking off on the whole dry nuary uh, thing. And so in mm-hmm. addition to, you know, they usually have uh, pairings of food uh, and drinks. So they're going to have non-alcoholic pairings for this one, as well as uh, full strength stuff if you want it. Uh, so that's a, that's a really neat uh, event that's uh, run January 27th through February 10th at the Dairy in Boulder. Uh, mm-hmm. And also on stage now, um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tony. I, I guess I'll throw in two, yeah, two more uh, that are that folks can maybe check out uh, soon. I was like, David uh, David Nels and Emily Van Fleet are over oh, yeah. doing The Wind with Stories on Stage at Su Teatro. It's this world premiere musical that David's been working on for a while because he just became obsessed with this silent film called The Wind about this woman who moves to West Texas and is being kind of haunted by the wind and these thoughts. And uh-huh. it just sounds like a deliciously macabre musical. And I'll be, I'm going to be there tomorrow. It's at Sue Teatro. If they're doing, they're only right now, they're only doing one, uh, one performance of it, but they're David is hoping to continue this musical's life. And so maybe if, if you can't get to this one, Hopefully you can see it at some point. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, this, this, just a one-off at this point, kind of, you know, it's a reading, uh, so kind of test, test it out, see, mm-hmm. see what works with an audience. And then um, hopefully we will see that. I'm sure we will. I'm sure somebody will want to pick ah. up David's piece here. I, I am sure. Yeah. I've, David just has such a way with music, music and, and lyrics. He just, ah, he's so talented. Yes. And the, the other piece that I want to shout out is, uh, it's over in Boulder. It's a, a celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It's by Modus. Uh, Modus Theater. It's their Dr. King Jr. and the Radical Roots at the Heart of Justice. It's a uh, it's an event at the Dairy Arts Center. It features uh, quite just uh, quite a few uh, speakers, including hip hop legends, the Reminders, social justice activist and poet Norman Johnson, uh, the Colorado uh, Boulder African American Studies Director Dr. Relan Rabaka, and then it's two autobiographical monologists, a uh, monologist Candice Bailey and Jamel Roberts, who are just going to be talking and like making space to reflect on the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and the work that still has to be done. So that's going to be on actually Martin Luther King Jr. Day, January 15th at 2.30 at the Dairy Arts Center. All right. Great. Thanks for reminding me about that one. One of those rare Monday shows. Yeah. Um, (laughs) uh, Also on stage or opening soon, The Secret Comedy of Women is up now at the Garner Gallery at the Denver Center uh, through February 28th. And so this is two women kind of, it says girls only, you know, it's really, it's really geared towards the women. It's very funny. I, I my, at least my wife uh, went to it a few years ago and just loved it. So haven't seen it, but I, I, <laughs> I feel like it's maybe not for me. So <laughs> yeah. Yep. Also at Su Teatro, I, I can't pronounce this. It's like an Aztec word. Oh, it's actually at a uh, people's building. Oh, I'm this sorry. One. No, it's, you're good. Uh, who's the, who's doing it? Uh, it's still control group productions, but okay. it is. And I, gee, I, I should know how to say it. I just was talking to somebody about this rematch again. <laughs> I cannot say. Yeah, Aztec, uh, Aztec, or my language is very unpronounceable. It's Cuello Camoxin or something oh, like that. So that's what I was about. Yeah, was, that okay. sounds right. So January thirteenth through twenty at the People's Building from Control Group. Uh, very uh, sound, cool sounding play with a you know kind of a, a native or an indigenous people vibe to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's the, a, this is. It's actually a remount. They had done yeah. this once in October. And so this is kind of more of a immersive spin in the people's building. They've re- they've added some stuff, taken some stuff away. So uh, it sounds like it's really a new vision. So even if you saw it in October, it's something completely different. Okay, great. Uh, I guess on the other end of the spectrum, uh, Flower Power Murder at the Adams Mystery Playhouse, uh, which is, you know, sort of an interactive, fun uh, probably like a like a melodrama kind of thing through uh, February 24th. Uh, Magic Circle Players in Montrose uh, is doing a Walk in the Woods, Lee Blessings play about uh, two cold warriors uh, meeting. Uh, at, uh, it's, it's a really great play. It's a great two-hander, and that's playing in Montrose through January 27th. Uh, down south, Cripple Creek's Butte Theater is doing Crimes of the Heart from January 19th through February 3rd. And then back up in Golden, at, back at Miner's Alley Playhouse, is Amelia's Big Idea. This is an original musical uh, for kids uh, from Heather Beasley, Richie Kennedy, and Edie Carey. And that runs January 27th through February 10th. And if you don't catch that run, it's going to come back and run March 9th through April 6th. And I think this will be the first of their Young People's Theater that will be in the new facility. 
Um, and then uh, Jesus Christ Superstar is uh, celebrating its 50th anniversary this year at the Buell. Uh, so yep. that's running January 23rd through 28th. And uh, I'm going to go to that because this was one of the first musicals I ever saw when I was a kid. Um, oh, yeah. And it's we've got a, a Colorado a local in there. Uh, Joshua Bess, who is from Littleton, Colorado, uh, is on, in the touring cast of Jesus Christ Superstar. He's in the ensemble. And he's also uh, he is the understudy for Jesus and Pontius Pilate, which are if you're like, wow, the two two opposite characters. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's his track. That's what he's doing. And I got I had a chance. I had a really fun phone call with Joshua this week, uh, just to talk about the show. And uh, that'll be a piece that's coming out in Westward. So get pumped about Jesus Christ Superstar. All right, great. <laughs> well, uh, wish wish the the main leads of those parts well. But if they do happen to get a cold or something, it'd be great to see him get a chance to Le- step in. Yeah, yeah, it'd be awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's that's most of uh, the stuff that's coming up shortly. Tony, you usually have uh, a couple of extras. What what have you got this week? Yeah, I'll throw out a couple. I'll be going over to Curious uh, this upcoming week to check out the world premiere of uh, Truth Be Told over there. Uh, it's directed by Christy Montour Larson, who just did the minutes over there. And it's a two-person cast, a, a Karen Slack and then Jada Susanna Dickens. Uh, and it's a, just the story of this journalist who is going to talk to this mother uh, who is, they've been involved in a, in a school shooting somehow, I believe it's, I think that, uh, and so it's this harrowing play of their conversation and just this conversation about, uh, about gun violence in America. So I, I'm, I'm curious to check that one out. Uh, I'll be doing a review for On Stage Colorado, so right. you can look and there. It runs uh, January 13th through February 10th. And then the other one that I'll shout out that's coming soon, uh, it's a, this is a this is one you know, but it's a fun one that you do not want to miss. It's you're in town. Uh, yep. It's over at Town Hall Art Center. This is running January 26th through February 25th. It's a three time Tony Award winning musical uh, about P. Uh, <laughs> and it's a satire. If they promise it's a satire, so funny you'll piss your pants. But be warned, <laughs> that means you'll have to go to you're in town. So uh, yep. it's yep. a local cast over there, and it just. It looks like it. This is. It's going to be a lot of fun. You know it. It's silly. It's a romp. Uh, but that's. I love a romp. Yep. And uh, I have never seen You're in Town, and I'm going to that. I'm really excited to see it at Town Hall. I'm sure they'll do a, a great job with it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, th- thanks for reminding me. I thought that I had that on the list, but somehow I skipped over it. So, all right. Well, uh, stand by here in just a minute. We'll hear my interview with Ray Bailey from Ray Bailey TV. been doing it for so many years and during that time it got really scary because i was in newsies and i'm like well i'm not gonna make enough money doing newsies to to like pay all the bills like i have to have another job so i took that as an opportunity to i'm like well i don't want to give up what i'm doing so let me create something new so i interviewed all 48 cast members in that show they each got their own video so it was called meet the newsies and I interviewed and, and cast and crew it wasn't just cast members. Uh-huh. And I wanted to take this as an opportunity to 
get some experience. I'd never edited a trailer in my life. I, I'd never done anything for theater in my life up until that point. And I decided I would take this as an opportunity to get the experience. Then after Newsies was over, take those videos and market them, market myself and my services to other theaters because I loved it so much. So I took those videos after the show, marketed them out to everybody on the Colorado Theater Guild theater list. And and my very first phone call back was from Len Matteo at Miner's Alley Playhouse. Uh-huh. And once I started doing his, other people saw those and it kind of it kind of took off from there. Wow, that's that's so interesting. It's what an interesting way to start and, you know, another one of those COVID left turns that uh, a lot of people uh, dealt with. <laughs> yeah. So, what what character were you playing in Newsies? I was Sites. I was one of Pulitzer's uh uh right-hand so, men. The one uh-huh. that kind of agreed with the Newsies, but um yeah, okay. He was, on, he was on the newsy side, but he he still worked for Pulitzer. Okay. Yeah. I just uh, I just saw uh, Performance Now's production uh, the other day, so I was just working on the review today. So it's very fresh oh, yeah. in mind. Did you see my trailer for that one? No, no. In yeah. fact, I was looking on their website to see if it was there, and uh, I looked on your website, and all I saw was the town hall one. So I don't know if yeah. you've got it out there yet. Yeah, but go check it out. What is the the value of a of a trailer for for theater? Um, you know, marketing, there's so many different things that theaters can do and a lot that they don't do just because they, they can't afford it. They don't have a marketing person, things like that. So how do you, how do you convince them to, uh, you know, to, to, to spend some dollars on a trailer? Um, well, my, I, there's differing opinions. I've actually spoken with people and I had one guy specifically, I won't mention his name that actually said, Ray, I don't, I don't believe this. And then he said the S H word, <laughs> he's like, I don't believe this S H sells tickets. Um, yeah. and I was like, I was like, but he was, he was, he was calling me at that point to actually hire me. He was actually saying, Hey, I want you to produce a trailer for me, but I don't believe this stuff sells tickets. And to me, I'm like, well, I don't want to waste your money and I don't want to waste your time. If you don't believe it sells tickets, then, then please go work with somebody else because I want to dedicate my time to someone that believes it will actually help benefit their theater and benefit set, uh, ticket sales. So I think that the benefit is. Yeah, I mean, I think of it like a movie trailer. Like if someone says, hey, you got to go out and see the new Wonka movie. Um, I want to watch that trailer to see what the movie's about before I go see the show. Now, granted, there are so many shows um, that people are familiar with that they already know what the show's about. So they they might not need to see the trailer. But I like to approach every single one of my videos from a, st- a, a new standpoint. So I will research trailers that have been produced for that show in other states and other countries. And I will try to do something new and different. And while telling a story, I don't like to just do a highlight reel where it's a bunch of singing and dancing with edited together with one song. Right. Because to me, I I think you're showing up a bunch of visuals, but I like, I like telling stories. So, and I do believe it, it does help generate ticket sales, whether it's one person or like, 20 people, I believe that, and I've had people come up to me, um, and this is funny, Alex, <laughs> I've actually had two people come up to me and say, you, you, you need to give me my money back. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, we watch your trailers. I went to see the show because of your trailer and I didn't like the show. Oh, so, no. <laughs> so I want the money back. And my goal is to make, whether I like the show or not, um, if I'm a fan of like, cause I film a lot of shows and I'm not a fan of every single one of them. Uh, sure. I love the artistry, but I'll film a show and I'm like, okay, I, I didn't like this show. It was very well performed. I just don't like the storyline. It's just not fitting with me. It's not my, my cup of tea, but I have to market that show as if I really, really liked that show. And then, because that's, that's what the theaters are paying for. And, and then I will make, uh, I, my goal is to make a show that, might not be everyone's cup of tea. Try to make it look like everyone's cup of tea. Uh huh. That so, makes sense. And then sell tickets that way. And then, so for the for the look of your trailers, um, you, you know, you say you don't want to just cut together, you know, a bunch of scenes. Do you intersplice like interviews with the directors or the cast or or things like that in some of them? Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, there has been a, a few shows where I wasn't really sure how to market it. Um, I didn't know how to create just a standard trailer where I tell a story. So in those cases, an interview with the director, for example, Cold Country that I just did for Betsy, 
Um, I interviewed um, Jessica Rob Lee and I, I, I interviewed Anastasia Davison and a, a bunch of other cast members that were in that show because I, I figured because it's based on a true story. I figured interviews with the cast and, and director in that instance will help sell tickets to the show better than just me telling the story of the show. And I, I started that with, um, essentially cat. It was like behind the scenes. I do behind the scenes videos too. I don't do them as much anymore because those don't have as much watch time as, as a trailer, but I started it with that. Um, by doing interviews with cast and crew and directors and choreographers and lighting designers, but I, they just weren't getting the playtime. So I kind of pivoted and I used interviews in the actual trailer. And I believe that that helps sell tickets as well. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask a little bit about the, the process. Uh, so first, um, I would assume you work with the, you know, if there's a marketing person and then with the director to set up the time and you go to probably one of the first dress rehearsals or something like that, uh, like most photographers do. And then what's your camera setup? Do you have like the two or three cameras uh, to, to capture it all? You get it all on one or what? Yeah. So um, my standard setup for most theaters is a two camera setup. I set up side by side. This camera right here would be my wide, my wide, which captures everything. So, um, so if someone, if I'm filming stage left and someone enters stage right, um, and I got to take my close up camera, I can cut to the wide camera and then zoom my close up camera over to them as quick as I can. And then that just gives me something to cut away to. Ideally, that's more, I typically do that if the theater is ordering an archive recording of the show. Um, and if there's big dance numbers where I need to capture the entire stage um, and and it's just so like overpowering, um, that's whenever I'll do that type of setup. Some shows, um, I can give you an example. I wasn't allowed to film um, an archive recording of Adam's family at the Pace Center. And it was in the schoolhouse. And uh, Concord did not allow us to film the entire show. And I was only allowed to use 30 seconds of footage from, from the show to create a trailer. So we did something tricky. I filmed the entire stage or the entire show on stage with my gimbal camera. So I'm on stage physically with the actors. And I'm pretty, I, I'm, since I'm an actor as well, I'm pretty good at knowing where they're about, like anticipation. They're getting ready to walk down stage left or whatever. And I, I basically just follow the actors around and, and the dance numbers around and then get these beautiful on stage shots. Um, I got that idea from Hamilton when Hamilton released their, their movie version that was recorded on stage on Disney plus. That's whenever I got that idea and I was like, Ooh, let me get on stage with the actors and get some really dynamic shots. Now, I only do that if the theater is not ordering an archive recording. If they're ordering an archive recording, that does not act as an archive recording shot. I need to um, be out in the audience for those. So sometimes the theater might want me to come back a second time or I film the entire show on stage. I come back the next night and I film the entire show from the audience with my two camera set up. Um, and then they get the best of both worlds, a really dynamic trailer um, I did that with Dream Girls at Lone Tree, which was we had over six thousand views in one day with that trailer, and that's because I was on stage with the actors the entire time, and it was really flashy. So, uh -huh. yeah. So my my camera setups kind of uh, change depending on what um, what the theater is wanting. Okay, but yeah, you bring up an interesting point that some of the the rights for a show uh, they're pretty explicit that you cannot take or distribute a video of of much of the show. Yeah, uh, so you've got to work around that. Um, now, are you allowed to like if you if there's that um, restriction, can you still make a video that's just distributed to the actors uh, and the crew, or is that just verbal? Um, um, I can, so at, they are allowed in the contracts, the actors are allowed to take as many scenes as they want that they're in to create demo reels. So I can actually record the entire show and give an actor specific scenes that they're looking for. Um, that way okay. they can have, um, they can have, uh, stuff for their demo reel or use however they like. Okay. Got it. Well, and then the other thing I have to mention is a real challenge is the sound, uh, oh. to get the sound good. So how do you, how do you tackle that one? Well, I my favorite person to work with in the uh, in the industry is Kurt Beam. If you're familiar with Kurt Beam, uh, he's just a genius when it comes to to sound. 
Um, I bring him on as many shoots as I can. If he's not already working for the theater, I typically work with him um, over at the Fox um, Town Hall Arts Center. He's there all the time, sometimes at pace. Um, one of my really good friends that um, he's not working at the Pace Center anymore, but uh, was was Joe, um, and I forgot his last name, but Joe was outstanding. He just doesn't work there anymore. So you honestly, if anyone's going to get into to doing what I'm doing, you have to make friends with the sound guy. I, I have turned down shows when they say, the actors aren't mic'd and I will, and we don't have a, a soundboard for you to plug into. I will not do that trailer because beautiful footage with awful sound equals an equals awful footage. Like no one, no one wants to see that sound (laughs) is so important. So what I like to do is I bring in Kurt. I say, well, I've all, I I charge this amount of of money um, to bring in my buddy, Kurt. Everyone knows Kurt in the industry. So um, he will mic up up to 20 actors. Um, He's, he's able to mic up up to 20 actors and he records everything on his own little um, zoom mixer board that he's got right there. And then he hands me the card afterwards and then I sync it up. So I bring him, I mean, yeah, him and I work together all the time. We're actually working together tomorrow. Um, <laughs> up at Betsy. Right. Well, so. it really shows because you know, your trailers really, they do have very nice sound to them, which, oh, which is you. really what makes them look, you know, look and sound really professional. Hats so, off to Kurt. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, uh, the other thing, and this is speaking from the point of view of like a marketing person and someone who's very interested in theater marketing and how theaters can do better at it. You've, They've 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 made this investment in a trailer. Their next big thing is getting it out there. What mm-hmm. do you tell them about that? And how is that sometimes frustrating? They don't get it out there as much as you think they should. Or what are some of the best practices there? Yeah. So there. I mean, it depends on what theater I'm working with. Like um, me and Stephen Burge at Town Hall Arts Center. He's their marketing guy. Him yeah, and I work hand in hand. We create the script for the trailer, the shot list. We're doing something really fun for you're in town coming up, where we're filming the actors on the buildings of all downtown Littleton and we're flying a drone. Um, and it's really cool. And we're filming that this coming Sunday for their production of year in town. So there's people like Steven who him and I really, really work well together. And we, we love the ideas we bounce off each other. Um, town hall art center is also extremely good at just getting it out there immediately. Some theaters allow me to post the trailer first. Because I, I finish the trailer. I send it to them for approval. They say, it's approved. I say, great, can I post the trailer? And they say, no, we got to wait because we've got this marketing campaign and we're not going to do it till two o'clock on Thursday. Then I have to kind of sit on my hands and not do anything. Uh-huh. Um, Stephen Burge and, Town Hall and, and Robert Michael Sanders, they're really good at just saying, you know what, just get it out there because the sooner we get it out there, the more people will buy tickets um, or the faster people will buy tickets. So there's people like that um, that I work really good w- with. Um, I also, Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center, um, I work really well with them. They are one of those that they hire me. I don't, I can't post until they post um, the video, but they also hire me to do Instagram format trailers. So I have to reframe everything and position it so it's, it's Instagram friendly up in like nine by 16 uh, format. But um, my my advice to basically all the theaters is get it out as quick as possible. Share it. I I share it on all the theater, the Colorado Theater Facebook groups. Um, I share it on my website. I share it on my YouTube channel now. Um, I share it on Instagram. And I tag as many people that I know that are in the show. I tag them in the video. And then they share it. So I would say... My advice to any theater that, um, especially at just marketing departments, I, I getting it out there as quick as possible is my advice. I say, don't wait. If you have a specific marketing campaign where you can't post it till Thursday, I don't see the harm in posting it three days earlier because that's three days earlier that you can actually market the show and, and get people to buy tickets. Yeah. Squeeze all the juice out of, uh, at it that you can right so yeah. uh, um, i wanted to ask um as we, uh, we kind of wind down here is um so let's say you're a dinky little theater and you don't have you have 50 dollars marketing budget you know what would you suggest uh these theaters can do to to make to kind of work in that video space uh you know for for cheap and i'm thinking kind of like you know backstage with an instagram post or facebook post like what what is the value of that and why should theaters be doing that um i think 
if you've got an iPhone and I'm getting ready to train everybody because, um, kind of a side note here, Alex, real quick. Um, I started my YouTube channel. I hadn't been, I've had people ask me all the time, why aren't you on YouTube yet? Cause I was hosting all my videos on Vimeo and I just started a YouTube channel with the idea in mind that I'm going to train a lot it pretty much any theater can market their shows through dynamic video production if they have an iPhone and a simple editing software like CapCut if they wanted to do it that way. And I'm getting ready to, and the reason I'm doing this is because I am noticing like Miner's Alley Playhouse, they don't have it in the budget anymore to use me. They were my very first and they just let me go um, right after they opened their new space. And so I'm no longer doing videos for Miner's Alley Playhouse. And that gave me the idea. I wasn't hurt because, I mean, I miss them. They're my family and everything um, at this point. But my goal for theaters is to teach them how to market themselves um, through dynamic trailer editing without having to hire me. And eventually I can be like a consultant where like, and you, free of charge, I won't charge anything for my services. I will help you market your shows by teaching you what you need to do. So if you do have a small budget, even if you have a large budget, use the budget you would have used to hire me to, to pay your actors. I mean, to pay the stage manager who needs like double the pay in every single show because they're incredible. <laughs> um, so use the money you would have used for me for something else. And then I will just, uh, it's almost like I'm trying to pay it forward because they've taken care of me for five years. All these theaters have taken care of me for five years that I'm to the point now where it's okay if I take a step back and help other theaters market themselves. And on my channel, I'm actually releasing a video this week. All my videos are on there now. Um, all my trailers. I'm going to do like a top 10, my top 10 favorite trailers coming up soon. Um, but on that, I am going to teach anything that they want to learn the the importance of title cards the importance of of cutaway shots uh music sound like you mentioned is extremely important but all of these things that you can do with your iphone um for a fraction of the cost where you don't need to use me that's that's my goal so if people subscribe to my youtube channel uh, a little plug here shameless plug um yep. it is the theater trailer guy so if they just type in the theater trailer guy I think you can also type in Ray Bailey TV and it'll bring it up. But um, I literally this week I'm getting ready to launch a bunch of, or uh, starting the beginning process of a bunch of videos, training theaters to not have to use me anymore. And then my goal, sadly enough is for theaters to say, you know what, Ray, we've learned enough from your channel that we don't need you anymore. Um, thank you. Um, and you can go on your merry way. And I will feel happy with that because theaters, I believe are struggling financially and I almost feel bad taking their money to market their shows when I know in my head, it's so easy for you to market the show yourself. You don't need me. So yeah. let me teach you how to do that. So, yeah, you're, you know, I, you and I are very much on the same page. I, I've done a couple of theater marketing workshops, uh, you know, one online through Colorado Theater Guild and another with, at the Colorado Community Theater Coalition uh, earlier uh, or last fall. Um, and it's just something that, you know, it, you don't have to spend a lot of money. You just have to do it, you know, mm -hmm. and you just need to know like some core things uh, to do. And video is, is a, is a huge one of them. Uh, but, but one last thing I would ask you though, uh, in terms of the, like that return on investment. So a, a, a trailer isn't necessarily going to have people clicking on, you know, buying tickets or whatever all the time. That's not always the goal. It's, it's that overall familiarity of the show and the work from the theater. Right. And, and, and that sort of umbrella effect of, of all of that. Right. I mean, is that kind of how you explain it to, to theaters? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I mean, a lot of them just want to show off the quality of their work. There's so many theaters out there that have unbelievable Broadway style or Broadway quality shows that are only like performance now. Oh my gosh, they're incredible. Um, and their, their shows only run two weeks and it's, or three weeks, three weekends, but two full weeks. And to me, it's, it's heartbreaking. Those shows need to, especially little women. Oh my gosh, for them, that should have ran for three months. Um, yeah. because they're so incredible. So, um, yeah, to answer your, what was your, what was your question? I'm really good at breaking off on. Oh no, that's all right. I was just talking about ROI and, and like, you know, how theater shouldn't expect that every, oh. every person that sees the trail is going to click and buy tickets. 
Yeah. So basically showing off their quality work, make, making other actors, making other techs, making other people that are backstage um, see that, oh my gosh, the quality of work that's being put on by this theater, I want to go audition for them. I never, I never even knew they existed because right. I've never even seen videos of theirs. I've seen pictures. Yeah. But um, yeah, it I also think it's helps. A, uh, yeah, you may know, like, say it's a show is is Newsies. You may be familiar with it, but you might be skeptical. It's like, can I go? Are they going to be able to pull this off? This little theater to do this big show uh, with a pit orchestra and all that, and a trailer will tell you. It's like, look, you know, it's it's good. It's pretty good, you know, for, yeah. for what they're doing, uh, whatever the theater is. So yeah, it's, it's great. To, it's a great service. Uh, and it's a great, uh, you know, we live in a very video centric, you know, place where, you know, it's like looking at videos is how a lot of people determine uh, what they're going to go to. So yeah, I think you're doing God's work there, Ray. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so Ray Bailey, uh, Ray Bailey TV, he is on YouTube at the theater trailer guy, uh, on YouTube. So check it out on there. And, um, uh, we look forward to seeing. So you've got a couple coming up. You're in town at Town Hall Arts Center. You'll have a, a trailer of that. And you're also doing uh, like the, the reading of The Importance of Being Earnest from Betsy. Is that correct? That's tomorrow. Yep. All right. So, all right, Ray. Well, thanks so much for being on the Onstage Colorado podcast. And uh, we will uh, look for you out there. On YouTube. All right. That's it for this week's episode. Thanks so much to Ray Bailey for coming on to talk about the theater trailers. And, of course, Tony, for helping us walk through all of these shows. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, thank you, Alex. That was a great conversation you had with Ray, too. Yeah. So uh, we'll be back next week with more Colorado theater news, as well as an interview with Josh Blanchard, director of Colorado Creative Industries, to talk about this a and centered arm of our state government and how it works with arts organizations around Colorado. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the On Stage Colorado podcast, wherever you get your audio stuff. Please give us a review or a couple of stars if you're enjoying this programming, and let the other theater lovers in your life know about us. And be sure to check out all the reviews, news, other podcast episodes, and our full statewide theater calendar on the website at onstagecolorado.com. I'm Alex Miller. And I'm Tony Tresca. And we'll, we'll see you at the show. At the show. <laughs> All I right. think we did pretty good there. Yeah, not bad, <laughs> not bad. All right.